subject is not very young, and this reflects itself also in the age distribution of the lecturers. However, we did try to have several generations, and as one of the main innovators of the younger generation, in so by some definition, we are very glad to have Mark van Ronsteck from the University of Vancouver in British Columbia, and he will tell us just what he wrote there. Okay. Okay, well, I'm, I, I think I'm glad that I can still be considered in the younger generation. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's uh, quite an honor to be able to come here and lecture in, in this uh, event. Um, so I'm going to be talking about in my lectures uh, the subject um, that concerns quantum gravity. Um, so it's, as David mentioned, a major challenge. It's been a major challenge for theoretical physics um, to understand gravity within the framework of quantum mechanics, which, which we take to be the basic framework for the physics of our universe. Um, it's a framework that has successfully incorporated electricity and magnetism and then the weak and strong forces um, to give us the standard model that we heard about in the last lecture. Um, uh, gravity has been more challenging. Um, part of the reason, perhaps, is because of the uh, lack of a fixed space-time structure that we can work with. Um, but uh, there has been a lot of progress in the last decades. String theory has uh, given us a model that includes quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and its initial formulations, I think, were not um, not able to answer every possible question we could ask about them. So they were m more um, geared towards perturbative calculations. Um, but by the, by the mid-90s, um, uh, a lot of progress would, was made. And, and I guess, uh, I think it was, it was three weeks after the first paper I published, um, or I wrote in, in string theory, um, that uh, Maldacena came out with his paper uh, on ADS-CFT. Um, and so one of the most exciting things about ADS-CFT is that it really um, gives, at least for some examples of, of string theory of quantum gravity, uh, a complete non-perturbative description. Okay, so you have this non-perturbative description um, of a quantum gravity theory and the miraculous statement is that that description is the same type of theory that we had already understood when we were trying to understand uh, electromagnetism and the other forces quantum mechanically. Okay. This non-perturbative description is just a non-gravitational quantum field theory. Or we even have examples now of certain quantum gravity theories where the non-gravitational description is really just uh, a quantum mechanics theory where, uh, where you have a, a matrix of degrees of freedom. Okay. And so, um, so it, Actually, in, in my first lecture, um, David asked if I could provide a pedagogical introduction to the subject of ADS-CFT. That gives me 0 0.4 seconds uh, for each paper written on the subject. Um, but I'll have to pick and choose. Um, so, but I'll just finish by, by motivating um, the rest of my lectures. Okay. So of these ordered 10,000 papers that have been written on ADS-CFT. You know, many of them are, are, are um, finding evidence for the theory or using the theory to calculate things on one side from the other side. Um, after all of those papers, um, there's still very fundamental things that we don't understand about this connection. And so one big question that's motivated a lot of the work that I've done um, in recent years is just how and why does space-time and uh, gravitational dynamics 
how and why does that emerge from some uh, quantum field theory system, some non-gravitational system? Okay. And, um, and a really exciting thing um, that's come about is the idea that quantum mechanics or, or fundamental properties of the, the so fundamental quantum mechanical aspects of this system um, may be important even in understanding how this space-time and how gravity emerges on this side in the classical picture. Okay. Um, so in the, in the future lectures, I'll talk about how the space-time structure in these, in these emergent gravity theories seems to be related to the structure of entanglement in the field theory. And if you didn't have this quantum entanglement in your fundamental description, there really wouldn't be any space-time. And then further, we'll go on to talk about how some aspects of gravitational dynamics, in particular, um, so far, um, the dynamics uh, in, the, in the situation of small curvatures, if you're, if you're close to um, empty space, uh, how that dynamics can be understood actually to emerge from certain physics of entanglement in field theories. Okay, so, so my goal for today though is just to give uh, an overview of ADS-CFT and many things will be stated uh, where y you will need to go and look up some references uh, if you want to completely fill in the arguments and I'll try to provide uh, a set of references after the lecture. Uh, I, I assume there's some website uh, or some some way to distribute these. Okay. Um, okay. So let me let me um, be a little bit more specific with this basic statement. Okay. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to focus on uh, the literal ADS-CFT correspondence. I mentioned that there are lots of examples where you could have generally certain quantum field theories, sometimes quantum mechanical examples. Um, but I'll be talking about the, the case where the non-gravitational quantum system that's involved is an actual CFT, and a conformal field theory, and I'll talk about what that means soon. So the statement is that certain conformal field theories on a fixed space-time B uh, which, which we could choose, doesn't have to have any particular structure, um, are exactly equivalent to certain <coughs> quantum gravity theories um, describing space-times Uh, which are which are asymptotically uh, anti de Sitter, and I'll go through what that means. Describing asymptotically anti de Sitter space times um, with boundary geometry to be the same as this geometry. Okay, so I'll I'll expand on what some of the words mean if you're not familiar. Uh, but I just wanted to start by just drawing some pictures about what this would mean. Okay, so if we think about a, a quantum field theory, okay. So I'll just draw draw it as if it's two dimensional. So this is the space on which the quantum field theory lives on. Okay, and so we might have a vacuum state of the field theory, and According to this, that would correspond to some state of the gravity theory, and we'll see that that's going to be just a big, empty, uh, anti de Sitter space-time. So I'll draw it like that. But the correspondence would suggest that for every other state of this field theory that I could write down, there should be some corresponding state over here as well. Okay. So if I, for example, add a little bit of energy into my field theory, I have some small excitation Around, away from the vacuum, um, that might correspond to 
having my ADS space, but now there's a gravity wave there. Um, if I add a lot of energy okay, in the field theory, uh, that might correspond, that would correspond to adding a lot of energy on this side. The energies match up, and in a gravitational context, that could result in some formation of a black hole. So there's, there's going to be some kind of field theory description of, um, of black holes. Why do you call it quantum on this, on this side? Well, it's, um, so the examples that, the examples that um, are best understood would be examples of string theory, um, quantum string theory on this side. Um, I should say that in, in some sense, um, as I mentioned, um, we don't have a complete independent definition of this side. Okay, so, um, so it, as a result, we can take this to be the complete definition. And, but the, the definition of the theory is a quantum theory, so. Side, well, but just by definition, so if, if we have an exact equivalence, then the, the set of states of our, f of our physical system is our vectors in a Hilbert space. And, and so these are vectors in a Hilbert space. And we can add these up and we can add these up. Okay. Um, that immediately leads to very interesting, um, very interesting things. So because this is a quantum system, uh, if I have a state that corresponds to some uh, particular geometry, say with a uh, curvature over here, a star is over here or something, um, and then I have another state uh, with, with s some curvature in a different part of space, um, then since this is just some quantum system, I can have a superposition of these two things. Okay? And so it, it suggests that we should be able to have a superposition of two geometries. And that wouldn't be something that's obvious uh, from, from the beginning. Um, it comes out of this. Okay. Um, so that's, that's you know, an interesting point. In that case, we have a state over here where the corresponding state over here is not just some particular classical geometry. So that actually leads to an interesting question of um, which subset of states of these field theories would correspond to some particular uh, single classical geometry over here. Well, we'll we'll get there, but in the classical limit, in the classical <coughs> limit. Okay. Um, okay. So that, I mean, at this point, I should just spend about five minutes being really excited because um, th this is incredibly exciting that that it, you know through a, a set of type of theory that we think we understand, uh, according to this, then we, we now can understand um, quantum gravity, not in complete generality. So there are some restrictions on the kinds of space times that we can describe. Uh, it's a big question to extend this to describing non-perturbatively quantum gravity for cosmological space times, et cetera. Uh, but even in this set of space times, we can have black holes that form and evaporate, uh, et cetera. And so we should be able to um, answer any question about these black holes quantum mechanically by understanding the corresponding question in the field theory. Okay. And that one of the big things is that we need to understand how to go back and forth um, in order to answer these questions. Okay. And actually, surprisingly, one of, one of the directions in recent years is not to understand quantum gravity by doing uh, field theory calculations. People have actually gone the other way and realize that a lot of very complicated field theory calculations map over to some questions in classical gravity. And so people have uh, modeled uh, a lot of condensed matter systems that, uh, that are, are, are very difficult to uh, come up with models for in any other way. OK, um, so any questions about the generalities before I get to more specific things? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, Sorry, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's my next A, symmetries. <laughs> good. It's always a good thing to ask about at the, at the start when you, so. Okay, so I want to talk about symmetries and this will help us motivate um, why ADS has anything to do with CFT, okay? So what is a conformal field theory? Okay. So I'm going to start by talking about just some quantum field theory on Minkowski space. And so a conformal field theory is first a, a relativistic field theory. So you have Poincaré invariance, okay, some translation. So, so there's some kind of um, generator of translations and Lorentz transformations. Okay. Um, but in addition, you have some exact scaling symmetry. Okay, so there's, there's some generator um, of scaling transformations. So acting on, so okay, so if, if we were just talking about um, a symmetry, um, a representation of this symmetry acting on, on spatial coordinates, this is just where we would scale all of the coordinates. Um, now in the field theory, there should be a generator that acts on the fields, and the claim would be that this, this would be a symmetry of the theory um, even at the quantum mechanical level. So it's, it's uh, fairly easy to write down classical Lagrangians that have scaling symmetries um, where, that would be, um, where that would be broken quantum mechanically, like Yang-Mills theory, for example. Okay, so it's, um, it's a special property to actually have the scaling symmetry. Um, now in, uh, in certain numbers of dimensions, two and four dimensions, we know that, um, so this, Having, having all of these symmetries um, is enough to say that it's a conformal field theory. But in terms of the, so in terms of the definition, uh, conformal field theory should also have uh, something called a special conformal invariance under these special conformal transformations. Okay. And I'll write down what that does, um, just acting on some coordinates. Okay, um, so these are just, uh, acting on acting on um, just space time. These are, are symmetry. These are transformations um, that okay um, that affect the metric by some overall scaling. So these are the kind of transformations that affect, um, that affect uh, distances but not angles. Okay. Um, right, so as I mentioned, um, in four dimensions, uh, for example, it's now proven uh, by peop where maybe people in this room um, that, uh, that having these is enough to imply the full conformal symmetry. Um, and the full, the full set of transformations actually has a, a, a nice um, description in terms of uh, group groups. So you can actually combine these into a group uh, related to just the orthogonal group. Um, so we're, we're used to uh, Lorentz symmetries as being um, related to uh, orthogonal symmetries by complexifying one of the generators. So this is, this is the, so starting from SOD, this would be the Lorentz algebra. So the conformal algebra. Um, oh yeah, so for that one, it's SOD minus one, one. Yeah, for that one. Um, and so for the conformal one, it would be uh, SOD and two, okay. So I'm going to write down, uh, so I didn't tell you any of the commutation relations of these generators, but I'll now write down how these generators are related to the generators of this SOD2, and then you, you can work out for yourself what all the commutation relations are. Okay. Um, okay, so these ones, 
combine to SOD2. So that would be by this set of definitions. Okay, so the, the two are going to be minus one and then the zero that comes in uh, as the time direction. J mu minus one. And then these J's would just have the um, standard commutation relations for SOD2. Okay, so I should mention um, first that there, there are field theories that have this set of symmetries. Um, in one plus one dimension, um, there are many conformal field theories that we know about. Um, and in fact, in that case, the, the symmetry algebra is much larger. Um, but I'll, I'll just be focusing on the symmetries that are shared by all conformal field theories. Um, in, in four dimensions, of the, the famous example, of course, is this maximally symmetric um, Yang-Mills theory. Okay, where you, you add fermions and six scalars. Um, it's the dimensional reduction of the, of the ten-dimensional supersymmetric Yang-Mills-Lagrangian down to four dimensions. Um, or it's the theory that arises as the low energy effective action of D3 brains in string theory. Okay, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this example um, or any particular example in these lectures. Um, so I'll just state some. Uh, you could go and read more about them in many other lectures uh, that are available. Um, other examples, so this is d equals 4. Famous examples um, in other dimensions also come from, um, from low energy effective actions of certain um, soliton-like objects in string theory. Um, so M5 brains give rise to this 0, 2 conformal field theory in six dimensions that has no known Lagrangian description. Um, M2 brains in, in M theory um, give rise to uh, <clears throat> a theory which, which is a, a 2 plus 1 dimensional conformal field theory with this SO8 as an extra global symmetry. Um, oh, I should change this to big D equals 3. Um, which as of 2008 has a Lagrangian description as a, a, a Chern-Simons theory with two gauge groups and bifundamental matter. Um, okay, as found by Aharoni and Bergman and Maldacena and Jefferis. Um, okay, so, but, um, but we believe there are many, many other examples where, so, so um, as I'll discuss, we don't, it's not true that any CFT is going to give rise to some quantum gravity theory unless your definition of quantum gravity um, is very, very broad. Okay. Um, it, it may be true that given any consistent theory of quantum gravity, um, you can use that to define a conformal field theory. Um, but there, but there should be many examples um, beyond these and without supersymmetry. And there are many more known examples um, ap apart from these ones. Okay. So I'm going to try to focus on, in these lectures, I'm going to try to say things that are relevant to all <laughs> examples. Um, that was, that's one way to uh, restrict things to a shorter time. Okay. All right. So, um, so for these conformal field theories, uh, you, could have, you could have many states, and most of them will, will uh, break some of these symmetries, but the vacuum state uh, will be invariant under this set of symmetries. So that's a good place to start. 
And this leads to um, a motivation for why anti de Sitter space should be relevant um, to, uh, to conformal field theories. Okay, so if, if there's some correspondence where states map over to geometries and you have, um, and you have a, a set of symmetries that are preserved by this particular state, um, then one would expect that these same symmetries should be manifested in the other um, description of the physical system somehow. Okay. So everything on one side maps, everything physical on one side maps over to something on the other side. Okay. And so the simplest way for uh, the, the, the symmetry could be manifested on the other side, which involves some space-time geometry, would be if the, the symmetries are actually all geometrical symmetries. Okay. And so we can ask, uh, well, is there some geometry, is there some kind of uh, space-time geometry that has an SOD2 symmetry? And the answer is uh, that while well, there is an obvious space-time, um, OK, actually, the obvious one is, is a space time time. So R, OK, so R, RD2, space with, with two times and, and um, D spatial directions uh, is a natural space where, which, that would have these symmetries in the same way that um, Minkowski space has, has this as the symmetry group. OK. Um, but there aren't too many physicists that are comfortable working um, with uh, theories with two times. Um, so uh, we, can, we can find something uh, using this. So if I actually consider a point in this space, OK, let me, let me represent the two time directions as here, minus 1 and 0. And these are the spatial directions. Um, if I actually consider the orbit of some point under all of these symmetries, Uh, well, for some, for some choices of points, uh, then the submanifold that I get by considering the orbit um, is something with just one time direction, with just one time-like direction. Okay, so that, that looks like that. And I can represent that as a hyperboloid in this space. So x minus 1 squared plus x0 squared minus xi squared. Okay. Okay, so this, this submanifold of this space also has the SOD2 symmetries. Okay. And that submanifold um, is, uh, is what we would call anti de Sitter space. So there are various different descriptions of anti de Sitter space that come about. Okay. In this description, actually, um, the time direction uh, comes back on itself. So usually what we can think of uh, doing is, is decompactifying that time direction. Okay. So we have, we have these spatial directions and the time direction. Um, but we could just have many copies of that so that the time direction is, is non-compact. Okay, so I'll give another uh, couple of representations of this anti de Sitter space. <coughs> and I'll give references to tell you <coughs> where to find coordinate tra transformations that go uh, between the various examples. Okay, so if I just look at, um, if I just look at a spatial slice at some particular time, then what we have is a space of constant negative curvature, so hyperbolic space. And so that looks like that looks like d rho squared plus okay, so that's that's the space time with constant negative curvature. Um, sometime in, in two dimensions that would be um, that would be this Poincaré disk that Escher used for his angels and demons print, if you can, if you can picture that. 
Um, so it's sometimes represented as something where, OK, I'm unfortunately not Escher. <laughs> but um, OK, but it's an infinite, um, OK, it's some infinite volume space uh, with, with constant negative curvature. So it would really look like a saddle. Um, uh, in terms of uh, if you wanted to embed it in a higher dimensional space. And uh, it's an infinite distance out here to the boundary. Um, but it's, but edgy to sitter space isn't just that times time. Um, there's some factor here, cos rho squared d tau squared. And uh, so when you consider this, this warping factor in the time direction, what you find is that if you calculate um, light-like geodesics, they reach the edge of this space and come back to the middle in a finite amount of time. So if I draw the whole thing, okay, okay. So I, I could, I could have a, an observer sitting in the middle sends a light signal out to the boundary and receives it back some finite proper time later. Okay. Where that time is just set by this ADS length. Okay. Uh, if I draw, if I draw um, geodesics for massive particles on this space, then they're periodic. They bounce back and forth. If you ever want to calculate the, what, what uh, these geodesics are, um, a nice thing to remember is that they're really just ellipses in this picture. Okay. So if, if, you, uh, if you calculate them in this picture and then do the coordinate transformations, um, that can solve you, can save you work. Uh, okay. um, so this, this, this space time actually, um, even though it's even though it's infinite volume, it's it's acting in some sense like a like a finite volume box. Okay, so light rays are bouncing back and forth in finite time. Yeah. Let's see that. Did I write down a signature here? This is not the metric. This is just the equation for the surface in uh, RD2. But you're, you're using two times, the two time direction to be plus one. Well, so that, I'm, I'm doing that to avoid, so there's another, if I, if I swapped this sign, that would be describing this surface, which would have two time like directions. So the, the choice of sign here, if I change this to plus or minus, um, that for the sign that I wrote down, you get this hyperboloid that has only one time direction on the surface. And if I chose the opposite sign, I would actually get these, uh, these surfaces here that still have two time directions on them. Okay. And if I chose zero, I would get something like this. Okay. Okay, so this... This ADS, in some sense, um, is behaving like a box. Um, uh, and we'll see that that's true. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see later that that come up again. Okay, so if, if, I have a, if I have a particle in here, it will have you know, discrete um, quantum mechanical modes. Okay. Um, okay, so, so, th so this version of ADS... Um, is known as the global uh, version of ADS, okay? And so the way that I've drawn it here, this is indicating the time direction, and this circle is, is our sphere. Okay, so I've drawn it as a circle. And so if we're talking about, so, so here, here the, the boundary geometry is, uh, is a sphere, and so if we're talking about the conformal field theory living on a spherical geometry times time, then we would say the vacuum state of that conformal field theory on the <laughs> sphere is dual to this geometry. 
Um, sometimes there, people talk about uh, the conformal field theory living on Minkowski space and the gravity duals of that. Okay. And so there's actually another version of ADS that's relevant for that, uh, okay, which is known as the, the Poincaré patch of ADS. Okay, so there's a different set of coordinates um, that often come up. Okay. Okay. Um, so that looks like, okay, so that looks like we have Minkowski space um, at, every, at every particular Z position. We have Minkowski space, but there's this warping factor Okay, so z equals zero is the boundary uh, of the geometry, and then positive z goes in. So this version of ADS uh, is locally equivalent to this global version, but it only covers uh, a certain wedge of it. Okay. Okay. And so you'd find that, sorry? This. Oh, squared. Yes. Yes. By the usual definition of LDADS, it would be squared. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. So this. So this version covers this, and um, and so this. Um, you know this this diamond on the on the remember that this this is this really infinite volume and this this diamond on the boundary is a version of Minkowski space. Okay. Um, so there's an interesting thing um, that I think is most clear in this description. Okay. And that is the relation between, okay, well that, that I guess in some sense it's the, the field theory interpretation of the radial direction in this, um, in this geometry. So, so one of the interesting features of ADS CFT is that these space times that we say are dual to the field theory states, they have an extra dimension. And if we're talking about the vacuum state, um, that extra dimension is just this radial direction in ADS. And it turns out that one of the, um, you know, every, so every point in ADS, it's e even, even though um, my picture um, obscures this fact, every point in ADS is equivalent to every other point. Okay, so moving from moving from this point um, to this point, well, they're both an infinite distance to the boundary. Um, so moving to, from this point to this point, there's there's a symmetry. One of our symmetries does that, and it's actually this the symmetry that I called D. Okay, um, so that was the symmetry that in the field theory it rescaled the all of the, the coordinates. Okay, so the interesting thing there is that if I if I had now, um, so say this is my, this is my space-time picture. Suppose that instead of empty ADS, I had uh, some kind of excitation sitting at a particular point in ADS. Okay. Now I want to consider, and, and that corresponded to some field theory state, which would also have some excitation above the vacuum. Okay. But now I want to consider a field uh, gravity state where that excitation is. <coughs> further in away from the boundary, okay? So I could get from this state to this point by acting with one of my symmetries. And in the field theory, that's the symmetry that stretches everything out. So whatever excitation I have over there, the, the field theory state that corresponds to this thing would be that one, but, it, but just stretched out, okay? And so that suggests that the radial direction in the, f in, the, uh, in the gravity picture is related to the scale in the field theory. That describing things deep down away from the boundary um, necessarily involves um, describing you know, long wavelength type uh, excitations in the field theory. Okay. So sometimes we call this the IR end of the, of the radial direction. And describing things, if I, if, conversely, if I wanted to bring this excitation very close to the boundary, um, I, would, I would apply the symmetry the other way, and that would shrink my excitation down smaller and smaller, 
And now it would be described by very short wavelength excitations in the field theory. Okay, so this would be sometimes we refer to as the UV um, end of the space-time. Okay. Yeah, so a geodesic, right, um, we could have actually just, just say this geodesic here, okay. So in, in this patch, what happens is that um, if, I, if I put a particle there, so if I consider the dynamics of that, um, it will fall into uh, what we call the Poincaré horizon, which is z equals infinity. It will, go, it will fall to z equals infinity in a finite proper time. So the global picture is, in some sense, more. Co this Poincaré patch is not geodesically complete. The global picture is a more complete description of the physics. Yes. Like, uh, usually, uh, in the graph inside, there is not just one emergent direction, but more. Uh, if you remember. Uh, so yeah. Good. So, uh, you say usually. I would say in a very special case that we all happen to have studied a lot, um, and that which is. Um, which is in the case where you, you have, uh, say, n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory, um, then um, we have additional directions in the gravity side. So you have not just ADS5, but there's also supposed to be um, the product of this geometry with a sphere. Okay. Um, and, and that, in the field theory, um, one manifestation of the fact that there's a sphere is that the field theory has an SO6 um, global symmetry. So it has. It has as a global symmetry the geometrical symmetry of a five sphere. Um, now, I would say that probably most examples of CFTs that have gravity duals would not have any special global symmetries, um, and and I would I would uh, suspect that most examples where you have CFTs with gravity duals, um, you wouldn't have these large extra dimensions in addition. So I think that's probably. Um, a feature that's special to these very supersymmetric examples. And for that reason, I'm not going to focus on it. But that's a, a good thing to, to point out. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so if, if string theory describes our universe, it better be possible to have um, some of the dimensions a lot smaller than the others. Um, and so, um, well, I, I would hope that uh, we don't have um, six extra dimensions with Hubble scale curvature, because that's a very small curvature scale. Um, I mean, even in the, even in the optimistic even in, even in the um, descriptions where you have large extra dimensions, they're still very small compared to the um, big ones. Whereas with ADS5 times S5, the curvature scale of the S5 is the same as the curvature scale of the ADS5. Um, so I think that's probably a very special situation. Okay, so um, so let me let me get on to um, so th this this is sort of. general things. Um, so we've, we've motivated um, the appearance of ADS. We've understood an interesting connection between the radial direction in ADS and the scaling symmetries in the field theory. Um, so I want to get back to the question of, of which CFTs could actually have um, gravity doodles. Oh, you have a question. Yes. Ah, we don't, we, we broke the symmetries, okay, but if you break a symmetry, you can still, if, so if I have a state, um, see, I, if I act with the symmetry on this state, it doesn't preserve the state. So we've broken the symmetry, but the symmetry still brings us from one state to another state. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so now I, I want to argue that, um, you know, CFTs that really have some, some, gravity dual where the gravity is anything like um, we would imagine gravity should be, uh, they have to have some special properties. Okay. So um, let me first just talk about, okay, so units in terms of measuring energies in, 
I'm going to talk about uh, the sphere case. This one. Um, so in terms of en measuring energies on the sphere, um, it's there, there's a, the radius of the sphere. It's natural to um, write dimensionless energies um, using that combination. And so when we say that the energies over here correspond to energies over here, uh, in this case, we could, we could uh, take energies and multiply them by the ADS radius. In some literature, these two are just assumed to be the same, um, but there's no reason that they have to be. Um, this statement is just you want the dimensionless energies over here to match up with the dimensionless energies over here. Okay. Okay, so I want to think of this, um, this ADS side. And so we've got a big empty ADS, and I want to think about what, what do we expect the lowest energy states to be on this side. Okay. Um, and so, th well, that would probably be uh, just putting in a particle, a massless particle. So if I, if I just take, take empty ADS and add one graviton, um, uh, well, that would be, that would be um, probably the lowest energy thing I could do. In Minkowski space, there would be no limit to how low the energy could be because the wavelength of the graviton could be as big as I want. Um, but I mentioned before that ADS space acts like a box. And so if you try to uh, solve the problem of, of you know, what would be the lowest energy, so you, you could start with, um, right, you could, you could find the... Um, start with a classical wave equation and figure out um, the, the profile of an energy eigenstate or, or a, a frequency eigenstate, I guess, um, then the lowest frequency state, it has some particular profile and some particular frequency. Um, and you find that in the quantum version, um, you get one over LADS as its energy, or if you If you like H and C, there. I've used H and C. In a um, and now I'm going to set them to one for the rest of my life. OK, so that's, that's, um, that's the energy of one graviton. OK, now, um, if we want any kind of classical limit, um, if, if we want there to be a classical regime, then we would better, we'd better hope that the energy of this one graviton um, is, is less than the Planck scale. Okay. Otherwise, there's no separation of energies between black holes and, and a single graviton. Um, we want to be able to have a lot of gravitons um, in some kind of coherent state that would describe a classical gravity wave um, without there having to be a black hole. Okay. And so this requires some kind of separation of scales. Okay. So for the existence of a classical regime, we need that this energy over the Planck scale should be much less than one, um, or that there's some large parameter sitting around in our theory, uh, m Planck times ADS, which would be much larger than one. Okay, And so there should be some corresponding large parameter in our conformal field theory. Okay. And um, so what is that? Okay. Uh, well, it turns out to be related to the number of degrees of freedom, or the number of, um, okay, roughly speaking, the number of fields in the conformal field theory. Um, so one way to motivate that that I'll, I'll get to more at the, end of the t <coughs> at the end of the lecture, if I have time, is, um, is <coughs> to notice that this combination of things, um, it shows up when you calculate um, the entropy of the conformal field theory at high temperatures. OK, and I'll tell you how to do that using the ADS CFT correspondence at the end of the lecture. Um, but what you find is that um, this entropy, or you, could, or you could calculate the energy, um, 
Okay. So it turns out that it, it I'll write this down. Okay. Um, so it's extensive. There's some factor of V, and this power of temperature comes uh, by dimensional analysis. Um, but the thing in front is exactly this ratio. So this is equals L ADS over L Planck. Okay. Um, so if we compare the entropy of uh, one of these field theories with a gravity dual um, to the entropy of just, say, a single free field in D dimensions, so this would be of order one for a single fr field, okay? And so we could say that this combination showing up here is something like the number of free fields that would have an equivalent entropy or energy at, at high temperatures, okay? Okay, so we could say that L ADS over L Planck to the D minus one is like the number of I'll call it number of degrees of freedom, but I've just told you what I mean by that. Okay, okay? So, that's, so that's a measure of, um, so, so if, we, if we want the separation of scales, in order to have a classical regime, we'd better have the number of degrees of freedom in the CF to be, T to be very large. Okay. Uh, so for a, for a 2D CFT, this would be uh, what we'd call the central charge. Okay, for for uh, for forty gauge theory. Okay, this would be n squared. So this is just the number of in examples where we can write down uh, a Lagrangian here in four dimensions. It is just the number of fields. Okay, because you have an n by n matrix of fields. Okay. Okay. Um, now people. So this 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 power here. Um, people have interpreted that. No, that notice that's basically if you if you take a ball of ADS radius and you look at so let's take a, a ball of of ADS. Um, okay, so this is one one ADS radius, and then we look at the area of the surface of that ball, and we ask how many Planck areas are there on the surface of that ball. Um, that gives you this number. Okay, so that's. But that's where it comes from. How else do you get it? Well, I get it from this entropy calculation, and then here. In the bulk theory. Pardon? In the bulk. Just like the same Is this? A, yeah. No, I'm. I'm. I mean, the only thing that here is people have said words. I mean, this is the calculation. Okay, people have said words based on that calculation, that. The theory has one degree of freedom per uh, Planck area. I, I'm just putting some words to that calculation. But, um, so this is um, well. There's there's a history of uh, of this idea that quantum gravitational theories um, that the number of degrees of freedom in those theories don't scale like volume um, as as they do in field theories, but rather scale like areas and and. I think people were um, excited that that is manifesting itself in this example. Okay. Okay. So as assuming that we have, um, so in these examples, actually, the, the n here, it's a parameter that we can change. So we actually, get in, in some examples, we have families of theories, and we can look at different, uh, different values of this n. And so in those cases, if we, if we, actually take the n to infinity limit, this corresponds to just a classical limit. Um, and then 1 over n degrees of freedom um, is a parameter that we can um, think of as, as being the expansion, the, the parameter controlling quantum um, corrections. OK. So this is kind of having having n degrees of freedom uh, being very large, kind of a, a necessary condition for, you, for your gravity theory to be able to have a classical limit. Um, I should say it's not a sufficient condition, 
So I could just take a whole bunch of free fields, and, um, and that would have a, a large value of n degrees of freedom. Um, but what would happen then is that you would have, so if I, if I go back to this, okay, so we said the lowest energy excitations are basically where you just have, you look at the fields, so typically we have some finite number of classical fields that can be excited around our ADS background, okay. And if I look at how many, um, how many states I expect by just exciting those, adding quanta of those finite number of fields in ADS, okay, um, well, if, if, I, if I start with a whole bunch of free fields over here in the CFT side, um, then it turns out that I get that kind of theory has way too many states. So I have to, um, I have to additionally have some, um, some kind of constraints on the spectrum, on, on the set of states that can appear in my... Um, in my CFT, the spectrum has to be sparser than it would be for uh, just a bunch of free fields. Okay. Um, in some examples, so I'll just mention, okay, because in a lot of examples that people study in ADS CFT, there is actually a parameter, okay, which is the coupling constant. Okay, so for n equals four super Yang mills, there's some, there's this Tuft coupling constant that controls how strongly coupled the physics is, and um, people people know that if you, yeah. So so if you if you just look at how many light states you expect based on um, based on the some some finite number of fields living in ADS and, and quanta of those fields, okay. Um, so that, that gives you a certain density of states that you expect at low energies. And if you, if you just have a whole bunch of free uh, fields, that, that doesn't match. There are too many states. Okay? And so what happens in uh, n, equal, n equals 4 is that there's addition, an additional parameter in the theory, which is the coupling constant. And what you find is that as you increase the coupling constant in n equals 4 from the small values where you have too many states, um, the energies of a lot of these states get large as you increase the coupling. And you're left for, for strong coupling with this, with this sparse um, spectrum. If you have a large number of free fields, you might end up creating higher spin gravity, which is also a theory. That, yeah, OK. So right, as I, as I said, if, if you expand your, your definition, um, which, which it may be perfectly legitimate to do, um, to, in, to include things like an infinite number of fields in, in ADS, um, then. Uh, it doesn't have to be general relativity. Yeah, no, ab absolutely, right. So if, if, you, if you, I guess when I'm saying, um, gr okay, so, so I'm, I'm being a little bit more um, um, tough when I say we want a classical theory of gravity, but, but if you include higher spin gravity, sure, maybe everything, um, may maybe everything fits in somehow, okay. Um, I, in particular, actually, with, with, this, with the example, with the coupling constant, um, um, so even if you take, so in n equals 4, even if you take the n to infinity limit, and then you look at, uh, so we have this classical theory, the classical theory doesn't necessarily have to be Einstein gravity. Okay, so in a given example, you might take n to infinity, and you find that um, it's Einstein gravity plus some kind of corrections. And in the n equals 4 example, um, taking the coupling constant to infinity actually is, is the thing that suppresses these corrections and gives you just Einstein gravity. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. I'm on schedule. Okay. <laughs> Please keep asking questions. That, that's probably the most interesting part of this, since a lot of it is very basic. Um, OK, so let, let's talk more about, um, okay, let's talk more about the spectrum of, of states. 
of the theory on a sphere. Okay. So we've talked about these. We've talked about these low energy states where in the field theory the energy is of order 1 over r. Um, okay. So if I keep adding more and more energy, um, well, what I would expect on this side is that, um, is that I eventually form a black hole. I mean, again, this is related to ADS being like a box. If you, if you just keep adding things to it, they're, they're sort of bouncing back and forth. Um, and they, they don't, um, it only takes finite time for those, for those photons to get back to the middle. And so uh, eventually with enough energy, you expect that there's uh, a black hole. Actually, recent research suggests that you don't have to add very much at all to end up forming, um, end up forming black holes. Yeah. How to represent um, how to represent that in the in the gravity side? What and what's the field? What's the field theory? You just take field theory, add many many particles, but you don't want them to thermalize. You don't want to get quasi plasma. Just to have many particles. But if you add enough energy, you're going to get that. At any energy, like any coherent state will turn out. I mean, if you, if you don't have very much energy, you might not. But if you have, if you have a lot of energy, then it, Without as far as I know, would. They should just flow away to infinity. Sorry, kind of you're you're adding. Okay, I, I'm on a ball. Yeah, so I'm on a ball here. So I'm adding I'm adding energy to some kind of confined or compact always system. Expect, always, always at at very yeah at very high energies um, I would expect that. I, I I know I mean there there are theorems. I sh my postdoc Nima Lashkari would be the person to ask about about this. But there, Yeah, so, okay. No, so, are you saying that, that people know that that happens in any force? Well, that happens in, let me consider global ideas, uh, and arbitrary small perturbation. Most of the time it collapses to a black hole, but though there are those marginal cases where you don't get, get a collapse. It's not clear yet. If there is okay, but that's a very small amount of energy relative to what I'm talking about, no, the, the big black. There are those uh, land, like uh, isolated islands okay. of stability. Okay. Yeah. I, so, so I mean, I should say there there are going to be special solutions um, that. Okay. So so I'll I'll go back. Um, what I wanted to say here was I just want to make a comment about the energy scale. Okay. So so forming this big black hole, um, uh, what what we're talking about would be energies. Um, okay. Actually, at, at the at the end of the lecture, I'll talk about how you can do a calculation. Um, not in the microcanonical ensemble where I'm at fixed energy, but in the canonical ensemble where I increase the temperature. Um, and there, um, what you find is that there's some phase transition. Okay, so the equilibrium state above a certain critical temperature, um, which is of order. Um, which is of order one over r, um, uh, is is this big black hole, and that that will so that will be present for energies. Um, okay, so so again, there's this parameter in here, which is like the number of degrees of freedom. So if I'm a, if I'm looking at a state of my field theory, which is which is sort of a typical state. Um, <coughs> And the energy is, is much higher than that. Then the typical sh state should look like the should look like the state of the, the thermal state, okay? Um, because that canonical ensemble is just completely dominated by these states. So there could be very special states that um, that look look differently, but but the typical state will will look like the black hole. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
And so more generally, um, okay. So so more generally, if we want to state so so this okay. So this is this is a very quantum um, state. We have ADS, and then we have one graviton sitting there on the background of ADS. Whereas this one has a metric which differs classically from the uh, ordinary ADS metric. And, and generally, um, that's going to be true for states with energies of order OK, so energies, um, states with energy of that order um, are going to correspond to classically Deformed geometries. Okay. Um, so in the next part, I'm mostly going to be focusing on. So so there's a set of you know, there's there's a set of solutions of of, um, of Einstein's equations with whatever matter fields you have, um, and and those solutions that you could find um, would correspond to something over here that generally have this kind of energy scale. Okay. And so one of the one of the interesting um, Questions in this subject is just trying to um, understand how do you, given such a state over here, um, you know, what is the calculation that you do to deduce the geometry over there? How can you figure, so how can you figure but, this out? But uh, normally, in, 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 this is discussed in the canonical ensemble. You want to discuss the micro canonical ensemble? Oh, well, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I'm moving on now to just an, kind of a, an arbitrary state. Um, that that would arbitrary state is going to correspond to a particular geometry. I haven't geometry. specified whether it's a pure state or a mixed state. Okay, so so what I want to assume is that the state that I'm going to consider now is one of the states that has a well-defined uh, dual geometry, uh, um, at least some distance in in um, to the boundary. So actually. One, one interesting point is that if I looked at um, a state in the microcanonical ensemble, so some particular energy eigenstate, then um, any observable that, that either of us can think of um, will have the same expectation values for both that state and this canonical ensemble state, unless we... But, yeah, but I'm, so, ge so if you talk about geometry, are yeah. you, you going to resolve the meaning that is it geometry is by measuring some expectation values? Well, or is it going to correspond to what we you know, classically mean by geometry, all the fun manifold and the metric? OK, so, so I'm, go I'm going to assume that there's some states, such as the vacuum state, where um, Where those would co what, you know, where in this limit these these correspond to some particular classical geometry M. Okay, so suppose someone's given me such a state, and I'm confident that it corresponds to this geometry M. Now, how do I go about determining what geometry that is? Okay, and so there are, there are certain elements of this dictionary that are that have been well known since um, the the beginning of of ADS CFT. Okay, so I'll I'll mention just some very um, important pieces okay and that is that um, there's a connection between the asymptotic <coughs> behavior of the bulk fields um, I can't remember if I've said bulk so far in this talk, but bulk refers to the gravity side, the space-time, in contrast to boundary. So, um, so the, the asymptotic behavior. So here's here's some here's some m over here, okay, and there's there's various fields here. Now, if I look at how those fields behave as I go out towards the boundary, um, that um, determines. The expectation value of local operators. 
So for every, every field that you have, there's some corresponding operator. Okay. And we can be more precise, but of course I don't have time to. So I'm basically stating the results here. Um, so if you have a field in ADS of mass, M, where M, this is just the parameter, and the mass parameter in the Lagrangian. Um, okay, so this core, there's some corresponding local operator in the CFT. Um, whose dimension is given by this formula. Okay, where dimension refers to how the thing transforms under one of these scaling transformations. Okay. So when the scaling transformations are represented on um, the operator, okay, then, then the operator um, gets multiplied by some particular power of lambda of, of the scaling parameter. Okay, so different operators would have different dimensions. And so if I want to know about the expectation value of a particular operator, okay, corresponding with one of these fields, then I have to look at how that field behaves as I go out towards the boundary. Okay, so let me do an example of that. So one example that we have uh, in every case would be the metric and that corresponds to looking at the stress energy tensor and that's probably the only example that's going to apply in all the possible cases <clears throat> okay and so this result is simplest to state if we're looking at um, just to do the example, I'm go, go, going to go back to the CFTs on Minkowski space. Okay. And in that case, um, so our boundary is Minkowski space. Um, the dual geometry to the vacuum state was this Poincaré patch of ADS. Okay, but actually a general as geometry which has the same asymptotic behavior, you can write in a similar way. This is known as the um, Pfefferman. So this is just a choice of um, choice of gauge for, for writing, choice of how to write the metric. Um, so you can leave the radial um, variable the same. But then you put in gamma mu nu of z comma. Okay, so this, so this set of functions here determines what the geometry is. Okay. And <clears throat> so in this case, okay, so the, the z the, the z goes to zero limit of this, if I just plug in z equals zero, that's the boundary metric. Okay, so in that case, it would be eta mu, eta mu nu. Okay, and then if I if I look at um, yeah, if I look at say solutions of of gravitational equations, then um, what I what I could f the next term that I, I would typically find shows up uh, at some higher power of z. Okay, and I chose this example because um, in this case, this actually is the stress energy tensor up to a constant. Okay, so I would, I would take my metric M, I would write it in this particular choice of gauge, I would do this expansion, I'd read off the, the term um, with a Z to the D, and then my stress energy tensor in the field theory would be some constant, um, which I 
Okay, I'm actually going to derive this in a different way using entanglement in a couple of days. Um, so I'll just state it. Okay, so that's um, <clears throat> so that so that's how this would work. Okay, now I should say that if you were just looking for solutions um, of Einstein's equations that are perturbations to this metric, okay, so I just I just uh, try to find solutions um, um, that differ from this somehow. Um, I will uh, I will find solutions where where this one changes as well. Okay. So I'll, there also exist solutions with gamma mu nu zero um, not equal to eta mu nu. Okay. And what these correspond to um, are actually not states of this CFT that we're considering, um, but they correspond to states of some other theory. They correspond to states of some deformed field theory. Okay. So we call these um, So we call these non-normalizable deformations. Um, so I think, for example, the gravitational action will differ by an infinite amount from, uh, from the solution that you started with. Um, and so generally, these correspond to a change in the theory. And in this case, we could say exactly what it is. This is, this is a state of a theory um, where the CFT is now not living on Minkowski space, but it's living on the, this geometry. Okay, so change in a theory to um, one with metric gamma mu nu zero. Okay, so if you just want to study um, gravity solutions dual to a CFT in Minkowski space, you have to require that this term is eta mu nu. But if, for example, you were interested in studying um, this conformal field theory on, say, uh, FRW spacetime, you could choose to set this equal to FRW spacetime and then find the solutions over here and read off the stress tensor. And then you, you would have calculated the stress tensor of your holographic uh, field theory on some cosmological space time. So you, you, could, you could always choose to do that. OK. Um, and this generalizes. OK, so I just I said, gave the example of the metric, which is going to be there in any theory. Um, but the same story holds for, uh, for general fields in the bulk. If I look at the wave equation for a scalar field or a vector field, um, again, I typically have um, I have um, sort of two independent functions along the space-time coordinates, along the, the boundary coordinates that I could specify. Sorry. There's no. It's like four in the morning where I came from. So <laughs> give me some. Uh, um, so let's, so. I'll just write down the general thing. Okay, so for some other field, um, you, you generally have um, these powers. Okay, if, if I look at solutions of gravity, Okay. Again, I have um, so, so I, ha I have these functions that can appear, and one of them uh, one of them corresponds to um, uh, the expectation value of the operator associated with with this. So, say a of x um, gives the expectation value of whatever operator is associated with this field phi. Whereas having this term here would correspond not, not equal to, say, 0 if the field is 0. That would correspond to, correspond to deforming your field theory. Um, 
Um, so this corresponds to L to L plus phi zero of x times O of x. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just mention one example where this has been used a lot recently. Okay, so um, so if you consider um, if you consider some conserved current operator in the field theory, okay, <coughs> then this corresponds to uh, a gauge field in the bulk. And so you might want to study people in, in coming up with models of, of superconductors and other interesting condensed matter systems um, have often been interested in turning on a chemical potential for some particular um, charge or current in the field theory. Okay? And so that would, just cor that would correspond to adding, adding just a constant um, value here. Um, and, then, and then you have your, your current operator. Um, and so you would want to then um, look for solutions where this non-normalizable piece has, uh, has whatever value you want to turn on. Or you could turn on a, a spatially varying chemical potential by studying gravity solutions where this one would be spatially varying. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, in the last five minutes, I'm going to talk about. So there's there's a there's a bunch of stuff that appears in a lot of reviews of ADS-CFT about calculating. Um, so we've talked about calculating one point functions of the of various operators on the gravity side. Um, one can also calculate uh, two point functions and three point functions. Um, um, using similar technology. And I will refer you to the many existing reviews. Um, you should have a look at how you would calculate the two-point function of, or the three-point function of some, uh, of some operators um, where you know the corresponding fields. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to end by uh, discussing this calculation um, that suggests that the CFT at finite temperature um, is dual to a black hole. Okay. And so... Okay, um, so if I want to study uh, field theory at finite temperature, okay, then I want to calculate, for example, the um, partition function of the field theory at some finite temperature. Okay, so like sum of okay, um, if you've well, many of you have probably seen this. There's a trick for doing this in field theory. Um, that is to notice that this is, as an operator, this is, uh, as an operator uh, uh, relation, this is the trace of this operator, which is the operator that propagates you forward by uh, an amount beta in imaginary time. Okay. And so this observation leads to a path integral um, definition of uh, the partition function, the thermal partition function, and that is one where you have, uh, you analytically continue your theory to uh, imaginary time, and then the, the trace indicates that, um, so, so you want to sum over the matrix elements of this where you start with some state, you propagate, and then you have the same state and so you want to have um, your fields at time beta equal to your fields at time zero. So you introduce this periodic direction um, and calculate the partition function. So it's basically the partition function of your field theory on, if you're studying your field theory on M, uh, on B at finite temperature, so it reduces to studying uh, the partition function of your field theory on this spatial geometry B times a circle. 
radius beta, which is 1 over t. Okay. And now, um, if, we, if we want to um, understand, well, what is, what is the gravity story? Okay, so that should correspond, the partition function on the field theory side should correspond to the partition function on the gravity side because all the states and energies match up. And so, uh, so, so we'd like to say, uh, what is the partition function on the gravity side of this gravitational theory um, where the boundary geometry is this B times S1? Okay. Now, we don't really know how to define the partition function in full generality, but in the classical limit, um, in the classical limit, um, the gravity partition function should be dominated by just whatever the classical, um, so some, some particular um, extremum of the Euclidean action. Okay, so you just have to find the extremum of the Euclidean gravity action with this boundary geometry, and then that gives you the partition function. Okay. And so that geometry, that Euclidean geometry, we would say is, is the geometry dual to this, um, this uh, Euclidean thermal field, field theory state. Um, or if we analytically continue that gravity geometry, we could say, well, that's the geometry that um, corresponds to the field theory on this space at finite temperature. Okay. So it's just finding, finding the, the dual geometry to the field theory at finite temperature is a question of, of taking the Euclidean gravitational action and finding the minimum of it with this boundary. Okay? So let's say we're, our B is a sphere and we have an S1. Okay? Well, it turns out that, um, that sometimes there are, there are more, there's a couple of extrema and um, one of them, um, okay. One of them is just like pure ADS, and then you have a circle that goes along for the ride. And in the other solution, um, well, it's more interesting. In the bulk, the circle contracts. Okay. So, um, so the punchline is that for low temperatures, you have one particular geometry, which is which is actually just pure ADS. Um, and that suggests that, well, it's, it's just um, for these low temperatures, uh, you don't have enough energy. The energy is too small to cause a back reaction. The energy is smaller than this n degrees of freedom that we, that we had as our condition for actually having a back reactive geometry. So you might have a bunch of gravitons in there and other particles, but it doesn't back react. And then above this critical temperature, which is of, of order the, the sphere radius uh, inverse, you have this other solution, and that solution is the, if once you analytically continue it back to a Lorentzian solution, it's the ordinary Schwarzschild black hole, but in ADS space. Okay, and as you, as you increase the temperature, that black hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and then if you, you, you can calculate the energy of that and the entropy, et cetera, and you get the uh, results that I told you before. Okay. Um, so that's all I had, and I think that kind of sets up nicely for the other lectures, which will be more on entanglement.